monumental changes are coming to America by way of the sea. They come by way of larger vessels and heavier maritime traffic shipping the nation's cargo. They come by expanding forays into offshore energy and aquaculture. They come by the heightened urgency to restore and protect coastlines and ocean habitats, and from the mounting needs of our armed forces to defend them all. We protect people on the sea. We protect the nation from threats given by the sea and we protect the sea itself from an environmental stewardship perspective. From Maine to Virginia, seaward 200 miles, an unprecedented collaboration of federal and state agencies and Native American tribes are working with new ocean data and extensive stakeholder input to keep national security strong, the economy growing, and to protect vital ocean habitat. This is the new blue economy of the 21st century. In 2013, there was 108 million metric tons of cargo that was imported into the mid-Atlantic states. There was also 107 million metric tons that was exported during 2013. Four of the busiest ports in the nation are found along the mid-Atlantic coast, shipping and receiving more than 200 million metric tons of cargo. New York's harbor alone accounts for approximately $200 billion in trade each year. And you can see right away that the prosperity of our nation is inextricably connected to maritime commerce and the safe flow of this commerce into these ports. Ocean planning fits very well with the Coast Guard's approach. It's critical for the Coast Guard and other agencies to work together in a collaborative manner to ensure the maritime transportation system is safe, secure, efficient, and resilient to continue to bring this large volume of cargo into our ports. The Panama Canal has been expanded, the Suez Canal has been expanded, um, which very much affects ports around the country and especially on the East Coast. The industry is moving very fast and the ships are, will continue to get larger. And I think that's the main takeaway is that ports will have to accommodate larger vessels um, or they'll be left behind. The whole point of this regional planning body is for every entity at the table to work together to maintain you know, a healthy ocean ecosystem, sustainable ocean uses, because we've found that you know, going off and working in a vacuum just isn't going to get it done for these pressing challenges in the 21st century. For the Port of Virginia alone, 374,000 jobs, which is about 10% of the Virginia resident workforce, are linked to the port activity. That accounts for $1.4 billion in state and local tax revenue. About 30 miles east of right where I'm standing here is the juncture of three very important aspects that contribute to ocean planning. There are commercial interests, there's national security interests, and there's also conservation interests. In addition to that, you also have the largest naval installation in the world. We have approximately 75 ships that are home ported here in Norfolk, Virginia. We have hundreds of military aircraft stationed here in Norfolk, uh, Naval Air Station Oceana, and nearby Langley Air Force Base. And so this is the primary training ground for the Atlantic Fleet just off the mid-Atlantic waters here. All this is in the same area where we have wind energy being pursued, hydrokinetic energy is being pursued, an expansion of the shipping lanes associated with the Panama Canal expansion is happening. Now, just outside of the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay is also the North Atlantic right whale migratory area, as well as canyons that are the home of some deep water corals that were only recently discovered. The Navy has a critical role in national defense in protecting the ocean highways and the global economy. So what the ocean plans enable you to do is, is it provides an avenue, it provides a mechanism, and it provides a process by which stakeholders, whether they be commercial interests, national security interests, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, the conservation groups, 
have the same information that's going into the decision-making process uh, through the use of the Mid-Atlantic or the Northeast Regional Data Portals. Data is the key for understanding the decisions that are being made regarding uh, the ocean. One of the biggest benefits uh, that's already happened is the assimilation of so much data about the ocean that previously has been in many different locations and not very accessible. So the creation of our regional data portals, we have one in the Mid-Atlantic now, the Northeast has one, some other regions are, are working on theirs too. And it creates that one place where you can go and find information about every kind of human use and every kind of, of ocean resource. And it's also helped us identify where the data gaps are and help give us a pathway toward what kind of future research we need to do in order to better understand what's happening in the Mid-Atlantic. That's really important to fishermen. And once you become educated on what ocean planning means and what the regional planning bodies are doing, you understand that it's a way to protect the areas that you fish. It's a way to protect the ecosystem. It's a way to protect sustainability. It's a way of continuing the tradition that's fishing. I think there's a common misconception that this whole ocean policy is more of a Democrat, more of an Obama administration thing, but it was the Bush administration that put together this uh, Commission on Oceans to deal with fishing interests, to deal with shipping interests, to deal with wind power, oil and gas exploration. We were getting to a boiling point where all these different ocean uses come to a head and we're going to have some real access issues. So that became very clear with this commission and they, they recommended uh, very clearly that we needed some sort of coordinated ocean policy to deal with that sort of thing. We're the canaries in the coal mine. We're the first people that start to see a decline. And we're also the first people that start to see the recovery. So, you know, with that said, this is public resource we're talking about. The oceans are public. And all stakeholders, all interests need to have input into that process. We need to be heard and we really need to engage. And ocean planning is, is really providing us that opportunity to be part of it. Climate change is a major issue right now in the Mid-Atlantic and the New England area. We're seeing changes in water temperature in this region that are greater than any other place really in the world. And as the ocean conditions change, we're gonna see species, fish species, uh, aquatic resources that we manage moving as well. And so it's really a critical element to making sure that our commercial and recreational fisheries are maintained while there are these shifts in the populations for which we manage and all of these other human uses of the ocean, you know, develop. I think where fishermen benefit is that as decisions are made in the future, it is the intention of the plan to provide for early stakeholder input it's in the intention of the plan to provide all of the necessary information from the fishing community so that as other agencies and other decision makers are thinking about and considering managing different parts of the ocean, that they'll have these critical data layers that show where the habitats are, which are vital to fish production, so that we can do our jobs as fisheries managers. I can't think of a more important thing for us to do than to work together. That's all that this planning is all about. It's just about working together. And when states work together, particularly if we can work with federal agency partners, with our tribal partners, we will be able to accomplish things in ways that are far more cost effective, likely to provide us with much more streamlined approaches to addressing the concerns and allow us to get better environmental protection in the long term. The goals that we've accomplished through the tribal aspect are right in line with what the states and federal government want to do as well. What makes it successful to date is the people that come to the table have the utmost respect for each other. And that's the bottom line. So we've seen that just in the process of creating the plan, having people together at the table for the first time, we have shipping industry people better understanding what the fishermen need and energy people better understanding what the military needs. And this just has never happened before in our country. So having this forum for ocean planning is, I think, hugely hopeful that in the future, our ocean will be in better shape. <laughs>